Now here is where we begin to see the emergence of a kind of sense of a cause in our community. It's in that interwar, late First World War, early interwar period, where you see a conflict emerging between different waves of immigrants, different people coming to Canada from the old country, and bringing with them a sense of national identity that sometimes forced them into competition and to struggle with other Ukrainians, blue versus red. Among that group, you had the founders of this organization. Mr. Gregorovich's own father was one of the founders of the Ukrainian National Federation. How many of us remember what the UNF was created to do? When I grew up, coming from Sum Liga, those were the Milnikiewicz, they were the bad guys. <laughs> He still knows I'm a bad guy. <laughs> but in fact, his father and the creators of UNO were people who said, wow, we struggled for Ukraine's independence, we came here. We see that there's deep tension between Ukrainian Catholics and Orthodox believers because the independent Orthodox Church had been created in Canada as a result of, in part, the World War I internment operations. There's the political friction between blue and red. And we're going to create a united organization, the Ukrainian National Federation, that will bring all patriotic Ukrainians together under one roof. It was only in the post-World War II period that UNO changed its political complexion. We'll come back to that. So the original founders of UNO, John and Andrew's father, and of course most of you know that I worked with John Gregorovich most of my adult life, were people who believed that we needed unity in our community, that we should bring together all of the patriotic forces, stop the infighting, stop the denunciations, and work forward as a community in support of the cause of Ukraine's independence. These were very difficult times. I cannot go into it at any length, but I'm sure some of you know, and if those of you don't know, you can read some of the things I've, I've read or written myself. Um, the fighting between these different groups in the interwar period was intense. Catholic believers took Orthodox believers to the Supreme Court to secure church property. People engaged in fist fights in front of halls. I do that occasionally myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> Members of UNO were fascists, according to some of the others. The Ukrainian Labor Farmer Temple Association, those were all Moscow's men, and in fact, most of them were. The Hetman movement were kind of quasi-fascists. The Orthodox believers were schismatics and illegitimates. Uh, Buk was just a bunch of churchgoers that were apolitical and of no use to anybody. Um, if you read, and I'm not exaggerating these things, if you read the letters that these people wrote to each other that have luckily ended up in some of the archives, you will be absolutely <laughs> delighted at the denunciations, the vitriol, the hatreds, <laughs> the passions. I wish we had a community like that now. <laughs> um, but what they all understood, whether you're on the left or on the right, or even in the center, was that we were a community with conflicted causes. Do we support what's happening in the homeland even though it's Soviet? Maybe a little, maybe not at all. Do we support movements that are going to change the geopolitics of Europe and maybe give us a chance to reestablish a free Ukraine, but doesn't that mean we're allying with the, the Germans and the Italians? What do we do? The Samostinica, the Ukrainian Self-Reliance League, says we will have no ties with Europe. We are Ukrainians in Canada. We want no connection to Europe. That's what they said publicly, but privately they were writing to Konovalis, the head of, of the OUN. We know that. Okay? So they were patriotic too. Una was saying, no, we will, we will work with the forces of Ukrainian independence movement. So they had all these problems within the community. No, no, no unity at all. And they all knew one other thing. That here in this place, we were subject to the surveillance of the government of Canada. Not only did we have within our community organizations, individuals who were informed on us. And this is clear. I've looked at the RCMP records. Kingston, Ontario, in July, has maybe 35, 40 people living in it of Ukrainian heritage. 
Two of them were spies in the 40s. <laughs> you, know, you couldn't have a borscht without some guy writing to Ottawa saying, Study le chouk vipu borscht. We had informers, we had uh, individuals like Mikhailo Petrovsky, now long gone, who was one of the best and brightest of the informers for the RCMP, a special constable. We had people like Tracy Phillips. We had a whole series of individuals that monitored our community. And at World War II's outbreak in 1939 September, the government of Canada seriously considered using the War Measures Act a second time to intern Ukrainians again. And the only thing that stopped them was the intervention of Tracy Phillips and a few of his associates, Watson Kirkconnell, for example, and so on, who went to the government and said, look, uno, are not fascists. Yes, they want Ukrainian independence, but this does not make them fascists. You can't trust the communists in the Ukrainian community because they're allied with Moscow, and Moscow is allied with Adolf Hitler right now, up until June of 41. So, we as a government of Canada need to take action. We need to intervene, intervene into the life of the Ukrainian Canadian community. And that's exactly what they did. In November of 1940, the government of Canada called together the leaders of UNO, of the Ukrainian Self-Reliance League, of several smaller organizations, into a hotel room in Winnipeg. No minutes of the meeting were ever kept. And they created the Ukrainian Canadian Committee, which becomes, of course, later COOK, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. The Ukrainian Canadian Committee, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress today, is a baby of the government of Canada. Created in November of 1940, there's absolutely no doubt about this, anyone who disbelieves this, doesn't know how to read archives. That entity, Kook, was meant to, elit, to last only for the duration of the Second World War. Again, in the archives, it very clearly says, this organization is only a wartime necessity. It's an expediency. We want Kook to last, to give us unity within the Ukrainian Canadian community for the course of the war. And after that, we don't want it to survive. Unfortunately for Kook, <laughs> this will be a sub theme. Um, unfortunately for Kook, in June of 1941, the Soviet Union was invaded by its former allies, Nazi Germany, June 22nd, 1941. And overnight, the Soviet Union went from being on Adolf Hitler's side to being on our side. And no less a person than Lester B. Pearson later a Prime Minister of Canada, said that it was nauseating to him, but they had to give up on Kook and switch to the left. And so the Ukrainian Labour Farmer Temple Association, some of whose members were interned, some of whose halls were confiscated, got all their wealth back, Kook was abandoned, and the government started playing footsie with the left. And that continued, believe it or not, until 1946, when Ihor, Igor, not Ihor, Ihor Kuzenko, uh, defected from the Soviet Embassy in Moscow, in uh, Ottawa, and told the RCMP about Soviet spying in Canada, and sort of precipitated some of the early stages of, this, of the Cold War. Now, before that happened, a third thing that's quite interesting developed, and that was that from within the ranks of our community, hundreds, in fact, later thousands of men, and some women, volunteered volunteered to serve in the Canadian Armed Forces during the Second World War. There were literally men and women from all parts of Canada who in 1939 and 1940 went overseas to fight in the ranks of the Canadian Armed Forces in defense of this country. They established in London, England, the Ukrainian Canadian Servicemen's Association. They eventually established something known as the Central Ukrainian Relief Bureau, and their work was fundamental, pivotal, in helping to rescue the so-called DPs, the displaced persons, the political refugees, the victims of the war. Now, many of us are either ourselves people who came to Canada after the Second World War as DPs, as political refugees, or are the descendants, in my case, of political refugees. That so-called Tratachvili, the third wave of DPs, very clearly had a cause, the cause of Ukrainian independence. Whether they were Milnikiuchi or Bandaryuchi or other Yuchi, the reality is they were all engaged in this notion that 
they had been driven from their homeland, that they had a compulsive need to return to it, that they would do anything in the struggle to achieve Ukrainian independence. There were about 35,000 of these Ukrainian displaced persons, and they were saved largely thanks to the efforts of the Ukrainian Canadian servicemen and servicewomen who were overseas at the time. Stefan Pavluk, one of them, uh, my personal friend Bogdan Panchuk, Stanley Froelich, uh, and Hrapleva, and many others that you know, we can't name now. Mrs. Panchuk, by the way, is I think the last of their number still alive and about to celebrate her 91st birthday in, in Toronto here. I would urge you as a community to recognize the service of those people before the last of them are gone.